Hi, welcome to Shaman Warrior. This is episode one. I'm Paul Andrews, the host. So what the hell is Shaman Warrior all about? Well, firstly, it is not about the comic book series or the Korean comic book series Shaman Warrior by Park Jong-ki. I actually had no idea about this comic book until I came to try and register the domain address for the blog the website for this podcast um, <clears throat> and it flagged up that there was already uh, a website out there or a website registered I couldn't actually find a website directly connected to this podcast uh, sorry this this uh, comic book series um, but doing a quick web search I came across this and so I obviously had to buy the first volume just to see what it's about I can see that it is pretty cool the artwork is is really nice it's all it's mostly black and white and it's kind of a fantasy historical novel kind of thing um, with a lot of blood and gore and it seems to be set you know sometime maybe around the 1700s or, or, or 18 early 1800s and it's kind of high it's kind of like korean style swords and weapons chopping people up it's quite cool but i'm afraid that it's got nothing to do with this podcast <coughs> so what has this podcast actually you know what is this podcast actually about so obviously shaman relates to shamanism and warrior relates to warrior arts or martial arts so we're going to be looking at shamanism within the martial arts or where shamanism overlaps with the martial arts now why did i want to do this it's because i'm a long-term practitioner of martial arts i specialize in the Northern Chinese martial art of Xing Yi Chuan. Um, it's been my specialism for around 18 years. That's what I've been practicing. And, you know, it's led me to China. I've researched it. I've met lots of different practitioners, different styles of Xing Yi, um, different individual ways of, of, of expressing Xing Yi in different varieties within the art. Um, and uh, I've I've cross trained in lots of other Chinese martial arts and some Japanese martial arts as well. Um, so I've been practicing martial arts now for you know well over twenty years, and during that time, especially when I began um, practicing Xing Yi, I started to become more aware of the physical and spiritual and mental connections and the ways in which martial arts allowed you to kind of research and feel and experience those things. <clears throat> and it was really my main teacher and my main guide in shamanism, Damon Smith, that led me down this path. A lot of the actual work, I would say, I've, uh, I've had to do myself. But he's pointed me in certain directions and I've, I've run with that uh, to the extent where now I would say that my practice of martial arts and my practice of shamanism uh, overlap so much that I would say that my practice of Xing Yi Chan or my individual expression of what I find Xing Yi Chan to be, I would say that this is a form of shamanic technique for me. Um, but... You know, the, those terms or those ideas and those those subjects or areas of interest, the shamanism and the martial arts are so big, broad, and often misinterpreted. So let's just start with martial arts to begin with, because um, we can get that out of the way. It's, it's a little, probably a little bit more straightforward. The main things about the martial arts are that that. They mean different things to different people. So <clears throat> some people study martial arts because there's a 
historical tradition or a cultural tradition that they're interested in. They want to dive into that culture, explore that, especially if it's a culture of other, something other than than that which you've grown up with. So being a Westerner and and from the UK and, and from a predominantly working class and lower middle class kind of background um, where we didn't have a lot of money growing up and things were very kind of set in their way, seeing Asian culture and seeing Kung Fu and seeing... Um, the Chinese martial arts, <clears throat> it's kind of exotic and mysterious. And it does have an allure. And I think a lot of Westerners, especially, but even even within Asia, even within China and Japan and so on, people see martial traditions or historical traditions as interesting. And you see this kind of thing in Europe where people practice historical European martial arts. These are archaic you know, traditions that really don't really have much um, relevance, I would say, directly in everyday modern life in the in the 21st century. So um, these things become exotic and alluring. So there's that aspect to them that people might become interested in for that historical cultural aspect. Um some people get into martial arts for the physical culture, for fitness, for discipline, um, and also as kind of a person way of method of personal development. So here's an overlap as well, because a lot of martial arts involve um, movement practice, but also some kind of um, discipline related to either spiritual tradition or or mental tradition things that you know people will often class as meditation i'm sure we're going to revisit that term meditation a lot <clears throat> because it's not really a term that i particularly like um people use it again as a, a quite a catch-all term um so we'll come back to meditation. I, I, I think a lot of things that people call meditation really aren't all the same thing. And and certainly there are, there are things that may overlap with shamanic technique, which people call, uh, call meditation, which I'm not so sure whether or not should be called meditation. But anyway, there's those aspects, that personal development, kind of aspect trying to better oneself either physically or mentally or spiritually for whatever reason that may be um there's self-defense aspects i think that self-defense is actually quite a different subject to the historical cultural sport <clears throat> and personal development kind of martial arts um Self-defense can be much simpler. Um, it can be more brutal, but you know it's it's very focused on a subset of how can one defend oneself against um, a situation where where you're in some kind of jeopardy. Um, that doesn't really line up with martial arts as a historical tradition which might have had different um, objectives and reasons for developing um, but self-defense is 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 certainly something that can be a part of martial training <clears throat> and is a part of a lot of people's focus particularly when they begin training in martial arts i know a lot of people um, when they first start uh, are getting into martial arts because they feel a need to defend themselves against something that they're kind of afraid of. It might be they're afraid of being bullied or intimidated, or it might be that you know they're they're afraid of being attacked in public for some kind of perception that maybe they're going to get mugged or some kind of crime's going to happen. 
So they feel that they need to learn how to defend themselves. So that's so that's a, another thing that <clears throat> the martial arts encompass. Um, and a lot of people just practice martial arts for social reasons, as a hobby. Um, I've seen this in China and elsewhere. There, there will be a lot of people in all sorts of different martial arts and martial traditions that will come along to um, just to meet up with their friends and have a good time. They, they may or may not be particularly proficient or good at the martial arts. Some people are very good. Um, some people have natural aptitude and talent. Some people have worked hard and some people have just been there for a long time and 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 develop skill over time. But even there, there are guys, even guys who are really good at martial arts who, who don't really want to fight or don't want to... Um, be part of competition and so on. They only want to really just kick back with their buddies and <clears throat> have a good time in class. Equally, there are people who, who've been there, maybe they're beginners or maybe that they've been there for many years and they, they never get any better, but they just really enjoy it. So there's that aspect to martial arts as well. <clears throat> there's all these multifacets and, you know, for a lot of people, especially those who are experienced in martial arts, the the practice of martial arts becomes a mix of all those kind of things. Some of it will be practical and some of it will be for sport. Actually, I didn't mention sport. You know, some people will practice martial arts for sport, combat sport, sport combat, whatever you want to call it. And there's lots of them. You know, we all know the 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 really you know famous kind of stuff like boxing, um, judo, jiu-jitsu, taekwondo, a mixed martial arts, UFC, um, <clears throat> the, the fencing, you know, there, there's lots there's lots of martial combat sports um, as well that people get involved in. So the podcast is going to focus a lot on those things. Particularly, we're probably going to focus on something um, we're going to pick up on it a lot is a thing that we ended up giving a name to call, uh, we call this thing the miasma and the miasma is really all those kind of limiting beliefs that we build up around something sometimes these beliefs are there to protect us and sometimes the beliefs are there to kind of reinforce our own delusions or reinforce a system that we want to impose upon the world. And the martial arts are particularly adept at, at creating these belief systems. <clears throat> you know, it, really quickly, a few of these things could be, you know, um, things like my my style is better than your style, you know, and and the reasons for that there's a whole host of reasons that different styles will bring out and say, you know, our style is the best because of this and this and this. Um, and and we, we would say that these things are part of, of what we called the miasma that surrounds these martial arts. They... They're these block, the kind of blockages, the walls that we've built up that that limit us from seeing further and becoming more. So we're going to talk about a lot of these things. Some of them are prejudices, um, some of them are delusions, some of them are just just this kind of doctrines that people have have kind of signed up to. And you know, some of these things can be historical. The the part of the culture of the martial art and. Um, not not always. Sometimes these things can be positive as well, <clears throat> but quite often the, these things can be negative. So we'll, we'll talk about some of those things. We also I also want to focus a lot on practicality and experience and um, people's experiences of practicing martial arts. What I want to get away from is talking about things like the history and lineage within martial arts. These things can be important sometimes, but um, in terms of when we look at shamanism and martial arts together, I think a lot of the history stuff, we can kind of skim over that. I, I really want to get down to 
thinking about how we can use shamanic technique and how myself and others may have experienced that use of shamanic technique within the application of martial arts. What I really don't want to do is bring people in and we just sit and slap each other on the back and say, hey, I know this guy and uh, this teacher, I've trained with this teacher and that teacher and that teacher, so I'm so great. That's not what this is about. I couldn't really give a shit who someone has trained with. Um, what I'm really bothered about is is like what does that person know and what can that person do and how have their training practices got them to there. And that might involve talking about teachers and historical figures and how they've impacted upon that training and upon that art and upon the culture of that art. But I, I don't want to get it into, into being a podcast where we were just constantly name dropping uh, for the sake of it, just to kind of big each other up. So that's not what we're about. Okay, let's just let's get, move on to shamanism. So what is shamanism? The word shamanism comes from <clears throat> the Siberian area. And um, the word, I believe, comes from the Tungusk people. So there's lots of different tribes of people around Siberia, Mongolia, those northern uh, Asia, northern East Asian area of um, steppe land. So, so it's it's low um, highland areas, lakes, rivers, with areas of you know cold areas, tundra, um, and uh, forests. So mainly these big open expanses. And within these areas, you know, there were a lot of people who were living um, hunter-gatherer lifestyles and nomadic pastoral lifestyles. And within those, um, those communities, those small communities often, <coughs> there would be one or even more persons within those groups that would be called a shaman or a shaman. And the shaman, their job was really kind of to look out for the group. And they looked out for the group by being that person that was so fundamentally connected with nature that they could gain insights from nature directly. And these insights would would provide information, or help in decision making, um, or innovations that would help the group and um, give them some kind of advantage to survive. And um, you know, this could be things like what, what, where should we move our herd to? What time should we move the herd? What's the weather going to be like? Um, what's the best way to catch a fish from underneath the ice? Uh, in a frozen lake. Um, and sh- shaman really, they're, they're these people, these kind of slightly odd people, I would say, probably, who it's not enough for them just to see connections within nature, within the environment. They want to be part of it and they want to experiment with it and they want to try things out. So they're they're this kind of crazy person who might, you know, try sticking different shapes of stick underneath the ice to see, you know, which one would be best to like pull a net through a hole or something like that. Or they might be the person who picks the mushroom and tastes it, tastes a little bit of it to see if it may be be edible or or might be poisonous. And... um, the kind of person that that would like try and plant different crops and you know try and breed different animals and so on they 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 they're experimenters but they want to be part of the experiment and um i think shamanism has been misappropriated a lot in recent years in into more new age kind of traditions where 
lots of different practices are, are, are said to be shamanism, but quite often they don't really um, kind of get what the real shamanism is. Rather than trying to be part of reality and to see the underlying reality, they're more about imagination. And, and that's one thing that shamanism really isn't about. And when we go into kind of the overlap between martial arts and shamanism, there are, there's a lot of, especially in modern times, a lot of imagination within certain sections of martial arts. Um, and really what the shamanism is about is about trying to experience the reality of a situation. So if someone really tries to hit you, then you've really got to have an effective response to that. If you just believe that you can stop that punch or that kick or whatever it might be, <clears throat> but you haven't really tried your technique out before, then there's a high chance that that's not going to work. So what the shaman might do is they get someone to try and punch or kick them in the same way over and over again. And then they might try out lots of different ways of avoiding or blocking that that punch or that kick and then from the that they'll learn which methods are not effective and which they should discard and then they'll learn which methods are most effective and then they'll learn which methods are maybe so so and this experiential way of learning will come through so a lot of that experience of direct experience of nature is what shamanism is about of course pure shamanism shamanism within hunter-gatherer societies would be a lot more about the environment around that society that individual and and how you might be able to help that society whereas the practice or the application of shamanism within a martial context within the martial arts is more about learning uh, the realities of dealing with conflict. And that might be, on an individual level, um, how to defend yourself or, or what's most effective in defending yourself individually. That might be against multiple opponents or just one opponent. Um, could be in lots of different contexts. But it could also expand into group into like more military tactics as well. So that's one thing we didn't mention, I didn't mention in when we were talking about martial arts is that, you know, a lot of martial arts actually came from military tradi traditions as well or have some kind of military tradition or link to military tradition. So um, there's also that aspect. And, and obviously those, those traditions weren't just about the individual. There would be a larger scale, how do... How do groups of people interact? How do different specialisms interact? Different weapons interact and so on. But um, we're going off on a little bit of a tangent there. So let's go back to, uh, let's go back to shamanism. Um, so a lot of shamanism today is degenerated. And this is because civilization creates miasma creates these these blockages these these walls and barriers that we put up against uh, nature in part to protect ourselves so unless you go and actually observe interact experience being with hunter gatherer societies or um some pastoral uh, societies so pastoral societies are those that that move around with usually nomadic moving around with uh, with animals that they either milk or they use for their meat um, so these kind of small scale subsistence uh, tr communities where where they they they're needing to have a connection with the environment because if not you know, that can affect their survival. If they don't understand the environment around them, then they could end up being dead, either um, 
kind of killed by exposure through weather, through flooding, through snow, through starvation, through drought. Um, or it could be for, through predators or disease. Um, all these different things. They need to understand where to get their food from, how they can get their food, how to hunt, where to find different foods, if they need to move around. Um how the seasons change, which plants grow and flower and, and, and give fruit and berries at different times of year, which plants are good to eat, which plants are not, what animals are good to eat, what animals are not, um, what animals are dangerous or venomous, what plants are poisonous, things like this. Um, all these things. And then within that context, there's got to be decision making. There's also a whole, you know, aspect of how to interact with other groups as well, because obviously you got to you got to breed, you got to um, kind of exchange genetic material, and you know, coming in contact with other groups can be dangerous because they're trying to survive as well, and maybe you know one group's got some resources and the other group's not doing so well, and maybe they think. Hey, we could take those, so there could there could be conflict between groups as well. <clears throat> so, unless you gain direct experience of those kind of things, then you're going to be involved in civilized society, and this miasma is much much bigger in civilized society. Um, we've essentially built up lots of things that are trying to protect us from nature to keep nature out, and. Um, like I said, within martial arts, these can be these different belief systems. Within society, it's things like political, cultural, religious traditions. And a lot of these belief systems that have been built up are, are, are to kind of control people um, so that in a larger society, um, it's more difficult to control people and resources and flow of resources so you so civilization builds up these narratives these these stories these uh, belief systems in order to to impose that kind of control so so there's some kind of order to the society and society kind of works together and quite often within that there are these degenerated forms of shamanic technique so the shamanic technique but Usually because we haven't got that direct connection with nature anymore, they're, they're used in slightly different ways or um, they're used within a more urban or civilized context and that changes the, uh, <coughs> the technique. Um, some of these things are still useful and quite often they've been uh, preserved within religious traditions and within secret societies or or esoteric traditions. Um, if you want to know more about that kind of stuff, then I will point you towards podcasts that my teacher, my guide, Damon Smith, runs with with uh, with a, 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 a an old acquaintance of mine Graham Barlow um, so that uh, podcast is called Heretics by Woven Energy if you're more interested in pure shamanic technique and Damon also has a podcast this is one that I really enjoy called just simply called Woven Energy uh, the tagline there is is the Woven Energy podcast for real practical shamanism shamanism and that's with my good friend uh, Joseph Sikora um, so the Woven Energy podcast is all about um, the core, pure shamanic technique and trying to explain that and give insights into it and help people to start to practice that. And Heretics is more about um, the miasma and how it affects society. So that delves into things like religion, some, some martial arts stuff, um, and history and and how um, modern society and historical societies have been affected by the miasma. <clears throat> so we're going to 
in Shaman Warrior, in this podcast and in the blog, we're going to kind of take a middle point between those two podcasts because we're going to be looking at things like the interaction of the miasma and the different dogmas and doctrines and and belief systems within martial arts. We're also going to be looking at how shamanic technique is applied within martial arts. So we're going to be kind of in between those two things. Um, So back to shamanism. The esoteric traditions, quite often, these things will include rituals, um, rites, exercises, various things that um, people might see as spiritual. There's a lot of things in there, again, that, that people might call meditation. I'm not particularly keen on that idea, that, 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 that term meditation, but we'll go into that uh, in the future. And quite a lot of these things could be called shamanic technique, but often the focus of these things has been changed in some way. Um, you know, for for example, these things might include chanting, they might include stretching exercises, they might include breathing techniques, they might include making certain positions with your body, with your fingers. Um, they, they might involve um, certain ways of trying to focus your attention or your mind Um, and a lot of these things can have some aspects of of what might be called shamanism within them Um, and hopefully within this podcast we'll be able to explore some of those things and within various martial arts traditions what those things might be how they are practiced, what they mean, uh, what are people's different experiences of those things and what are people's different understandings of those things as well. So we're going to be doing some things like that. Um, Just looking at how long I've been going for, I want to keep these podcasts fairly short. So we're just around, we're just over 30 minutes right now. So I'm going to finish quite soon. Um, Going forwards, I will try and bring in other people I'll be doing some of these by myself and just rambling and talking about my experiences my understanding of different things different topics that I might want to go through I might talk about some um, exercises and techniques maybe we'll get some videos up on the blog or on on YouTube or something Um, definitely going forward I will try to set up some kind of way that you guys can help me out so maybe through patreon or some kind of site such as like the like coffee which where you can buy me a coffee if you enjoy the enjoy the podcast uh, drop me a little bit of a donation of some kind so it can help keep things going and you know pay help pay for website costs and equipment and so on um and also help me to possibly do other cool things in the future as well um but i would like to to give things back predominantly what this podcast is about is really talking about my love and kind of (laughs) obsession with uh martial art practice as shamanic technique this might be fairly individual but i'm sure there's a lot of overlap with what other people do as well um a lot of this mind body spirit kind of stuff going on in the martial arts and um, hopefully i'll be able to bring some people in um friends acquaintances other people within the martial arts community that might be interested in telling their stories um get involved i'll get some of my students involved and um, and we'll go from there um if anybody does want to get involved if anybody does want to give me some feedback or any suggestions of what they want to see then you can contact me. My email is paul at xingyiacademy.com and xingyi is 
the pinyin romanization so i'll spell that out it's paul at x i n g y i academy dot com okay that's my email so um so you can get in touch with me that way um if you go to our website our blog it's shamanwarrior.com but that is shaman-warrior.com and hopefully you know you'll be able to google that as well and you should come across a very simple website the main page is the blog and there's a nice big banner at the front with a quite a scary looking mongolian shaman with his drum it's got some bells attached to the inside of the drum and all sorts of things going on attached to his clothing and we've got shaman warrior in big shiny writing there's an about page tells you a little bit more about me um you'll find out more as we go on anyway there's a contact page that's got my email address that's all it's got on that page and um there's a link to my other website shinya academy um which is my online martial arts school <coughs> we also do uh training in leeds in the uk so anyone in the uk um if you're ever about and you want to hook up and do some shingy training or just kind of shoot the breeze have a drink and um, chat about martial arts and shamanism then i'm always up for that but if you want to learn some shingy there's a there's a link there we have online courses and um, and other ways of supporting people who want to learn shingy on there and you know i'm continuing to uh to try and add more course content next year we're going to get into teaching more about the shingy animals which will have a much more shamanic aspect to it but we do have a course on there already called the esoteric art of yan yi yan yi means researching the intention and and that has got you know it's it's kind of an introduction into um into what might be called by my teacher spirit dance but it's it's got a focus on the kind of movement mechanics or the or the framework of shing yi and how that's applied in in a shamanic kind of way so if you want to get started in that kind of stuff we have a course in there already that that is is a good introduction to it it's not it doesn't cover everything but it's um but it's a start and, not, and and there'll be much more to come um in the coming months and years and so on here and within shingy academy um next time we will be going into a bit more about um some of the basics of shamanism and and how it links in with martial arts specifically a lot of what i will be talking about will come from the framework of chinese martial arts and xing yi chan in particular or my understanding of xing yi chan in particular but it, shamanism is universal something i should have said is that and i'm sure my teacher uh, i'm sure damon has said this in his woven energy podcast before that one thing about shamanism is that it's 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 a natural practice it's something that evolves naturally through connection with nature so if you were to map where shamanism exists throughout the world then you will see little dots all over the place less so now but if you'd have done this in say the 1600s you probably find this all over all over the globe everywhere there'd still be little pockets around in europe as well even though europe <coughs> probably is the most impacted by by the miasma of civilization but you'd see little tiny isolated pockets everywhere and the thing is that this shows that um shamanism evolves independently from nature 
you know, if you left so and my teach Damon says this a lot. Uh, I keep trying. I keep saying my teacher, but really, Damon is, is is very much more like my guide in these things. A lot of what I've what I've learned and understood, I've actually worked out myself. And he's just nudged me in the right direction. I've had to work my ass off to 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 find a lot of this stuff. Um, but one of the things that he, he will commonly say is that if you put a bunch of kids on a desert island somewhere and they had to fend for themselves and you came back in you know in a generation or two later, let's say let's say in like a hundred years, you know, there's gonna be some shamans among that group. Because there's going to be kids that that have grown up only knowing connection with nature and using that connection to help their group. And over time, shamanism will develop within that group. If you, by contrast, look at a map of the world, a map of religious ideas within the world, so different religious traditions, what you will see is that they are usually... Yeah, you know, especially before the advent of things like the internet and 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 so on, you would have seen that they're just big blobs, and these blobs have grown out from some um, some locus, some 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 focal point, <coughs> and so essentially, a certain person or group of people in a certain area had a certain idea, and the idea has spread, and that idea spreads to only where that the idea gets to. And over time that might grow and sometimes different ideas compete with other ideas and, and some ideas shrink and some um, become extinct and others expand and fill out bigger areas. But these religious traditions are generally in big blobs, whereas sh- shamanism is like everywhere, in little dots everywhere. So it shows that that kind of difference between them. Um, I'm going to leave it there, guys. We're on to almost 45 minutes now, and I want to try to keep these episodes fairly short so that you can consume them fairly quickly. Maybe when you are taking a break from something or, or you know, on a commute to work or whatever that might be. And um, hopefully you've enjoyed this first introductory explanation of what Shaman Warrior is going to be about. And um, there'll be more to come soon. I'll try and keep these regular as I can. Um, Try and get at least one out a month, if not more than that. My, My real goal is probably once a fortnight. Talk about something related to martial arts and shamanism. Um, but it might be that, you know, that things slip. I have a busy life. I have a lot of, a lot of things I need to keep on top of. So, um, we'll just see about that. But, um, yep, I will, I'll try and get a few other things sorted out. I'll try and put a blog up as well. And, um, I hope to, uh, I hope that you tune in next time. Thanks very much for listening. See you later. Bye-bye.